so we should be recording now. Um, our judge for this session is Tara Wyrick. She works for DEQ in the Valley Regional Office, um, and she, I think, may have some resources to look at or have some things to go over with you all, um, and then it will be open to questions. Um, if you want to type your questions in the chat box, I will be sure to read them out to Tara um, when we get a chance. Um, and I think we're ready to go. So Tara, if you're in here, um, I'll turn it over to you and you can get started. Awesome. Good morning, Megan. Good to see your voice, to see your face as well as hear your voice. And good morning to everybody else. I apologize that um, I don't have a smiling face like Megan does and like many of you do. Um, uh, state computers, unfortunately, are not equipped with cameras, um, which, you know, has its pluses and minuses, I guess. So I apologize that you can't see my face, but um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, Megan. And I thought, let me see if this works, fingers crossed. But I thought kind of what we do um, is just have a um, kind of question dominated um, uh, chat. We can go through some different resources. We can talk about um, what questions you all have. Um, if there's particular issues within the aquatics that um, the aquatics test or the aquatics materials that you would really like to go over, we can do that. I did want to take a little bit of time and go over some of the cool mapping features on the DEQ website. Um, you could see it as a shameless plug for our new external website, but I do think that um, some of the cool mapping tools that we have available will help your teams um, uh, prepare, understand a little bit more about water resources um, in the state, uh, as well as the, you know, your particular soil and water conservation district or, or area. Um, so we'll, we'll take a little bit of time to go over that. But, you know, I should have asked first, everybody can hear me, right? Fingers? Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Brett. Um, all right. So, and everybody can see my screen, the aquatic macroinvertebrate identification key. Yep, excellent. So yeah, I know you guys have seen this, you know, since you're part of the advanced group, I'm, I'm not going to go over this, but, um, you know, in depth, but I do want to make sure that everybody understands um, the different body parts of an aquatic macroinvertebrate, understanding the difference between the abdomen and the thorax, where the legs are, a distinct head, um, just playing around with bugs, honest to goodness, is the best way to familiarize yourself, kind of working through these keys on your own time, the more investment and the more time that you spend um, with bugs or with fish, to be honest with you, the better you're going to, um, to be at this part of the test. I will tell you, this is, this is always a part of the test that has a lot of point value. So it's definitely worth your time to go in, um, not just the identification and being able to work through a key, but also understanding tolerance values. What are the main you know, um, orders that are tolerant of pollution? What are those really special, what we tell fourth graders are the princess bugs. You know, I'm talking about mayflies, stoneflies, um, and, and those types of bugs that, that cannot withstand pollution. And so if we find those, we know that it's really good quality. Um, I think this is all definitely uh, kind of worth your time. While we're here, does anybody have any questions about um, aquatic macroinvertebrates um, or, or, yeah, just any questions about this? And Megan, you said you're gonna read any chat box, so I don't have to monitor the chat box. You're doing that for us, right? I am monitoring the chat box. I don't see anything yet, but I will let you know. Excellent, okay, thank you. All right, well, if there's nothing about the bugs, which are my personal favorite. <laughs> right. um, we have one, Madeline says, what some really important, important ones to know. So I guess the uh, most important ones. Okay. So um, you definitely want to know what mayflies look like, three tails, right? And, and they have, um, gosh, this is where I really miss having a camera because I talk with my hands. And so you can't see me outlining the back of the abdomen and showing you where the gills are on a, um, on a mayfly. Um, another important distinction about a mayfly is the way that it moves through the water, right? A mayfly swims 
um, like a dolphin, like up and down and up and down and up and down because it has to move the water past its gills to be able to absorb the oxygen. Um, so mayflies are definitely important. Stone flies, right? Stone flies um, look like a, uh, uh, like a race car, basically. They're found in riffles. They um, have distinct, actually, I, I am connected to the internet, so I'll pull up a quick picture. Um, so, um, like I said, my son calls these the race car bugs. Um, oh, stone fly larvae would be important. There we go. And um, these are really, there's a good one right there. Um, they're very fast, they're flat to the ground. Um, uh, or you know, flat to to whatever rock or whatever they're um, they're on at the moment. So um, uh, the coloration, you know, they have great camouflage to blend in with um, but with the rocks and the growths on the um, on the stream substrate, and then they have the two tails. Um, so so that's a definite difference. Um, and then caddis flies are another good one to know. Caddis flies are those um, bugs that make their own house. Look at this one. Those are, are kind of my favorite. I had a friend who had earrings made out of a caddis case, which is pretty cool. Megan, do you have those too? Somebody at the district had them. No? Okay. I do not, but we <laughs> talk about them often. <laughs> yes. But anyway, um, these cases can be made of stones like, like this example here. Um, they can also be made of um, sticks. Um, let's see. Oh, here's one made of jewels. That's always cool, too. Um, uh, there's a, 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 a genus here. I, I live in Bridgewater, so right around the North River and, and this part of the Shenandoah Valley that's called stickbait. And they're very large. Um, their bodies are really large, so their cases are larger than some of these that you know could fit on your fingernail. But stick bait um, is generally like three to four inches long, and it's these big honking pieces of um, of wood and and sticks that they use and they glue together, which is pretty cool looking. And obviously, um, fishermen use it as as bait. Um, so yeah, definitely knowing um, the big three, um, the mayflies stoneflies, uh, caddisflies, um, knowing the pollution in uh, the pollution tolerant bugs is important too. So we're talking about black fly larva. Oops. Um, you know, these guys can live anywhere and they have, again, you know, I'm usually speaking to fourth graders in the spring and in the fall about these sorts of things. So they have a sucker butt. Do you see the, the suction cup on the back? And they, um, they actually just kind of wave in the water. Here's a great picture right here. Um, they kind of wave in the water um, and they can live anywhere um, in um, sewage pipes, actually. There's a, a species called tubifex. Um, it's called, it's basically a sewer worm and they grow. There's not much water at all. It's just kind of effluent and they still are alive and kicking and waving in the, in the water. So um, getting familiar with, with your bugs is definitely gonna be helpful. I hope that answers the question. Any other questions coming in about bugs, Megan? Yes, um, Jacob wants to know what is the best way to distinguish between a midge larva and a beetle larva? Oh, good question. Let me see if I can pull up one of my keys. I have my Embarathon. Um, I had another key and I'm trying to find out where it was. I should have had it open. Um, So he wants to know the difference between a midge and a riffle beetle. I'm sorry, say it again. Um, he's just said a beetle, a midge oh. larva and a beetle larva. Oh, uh, that's a good question. You know what? Instead of taking time and doing a Google search, I'm going to um, look at that and I'll get back to you. Megan, can I pass along some resources to you for distribution to the group? Um, yes, I think Stephanie has a list of all the participants and we can send out stuff um, afterwards. Okay, gotcha. 
And then there's one more general question, which I figure we can cover so we don't forget it. Um, yeah. What do you think is the is the acceptable level of dissolved oxygen for most aquatic organisms? Because I've seen anything from four parts per million to six. That's interesting. Four to six parts per million. Okay. Um, um, you know, we don't have um, the water quality standards for dissolved oxygen are not um, at one specific level. They're actually ranges because um, we know that dissolved oxygen fluctuates with temperature season, you know, through the seasons. We know that it fluctuates through the day with water temperature and the sun rising versus shade. Um, so, you know, I think generally when you're asked that question on an Envirothon test, they're going to give you the ranges or, or accept ranges as a correct answer. You know, there, there's nothing wrong with, the, with saying um, dissolved oxygen is naturally found between four and or healthy stream dissolved oxygen is naturally found between four and six parts per million. Um, I think that's an acceptable answer. All right, and then the only other thing is, can you be sure to send me that dichotomous key? Cause some people would like that as a resource. That you oh, sure. Prefer. I was thinking it was on the Envirothon website, but maybe not. So yes, I will, I will definitely send it and that way everybody has it. Um, yeah, there's some other, there's some great visual resources through Virginia Save Our Streams. Um, I'll send those out too, but Virginia. Um, yeah, so, so they have some great ones. Isaac Walton League um, does some good ones for uh, benthic macroinvertebrates. Isaac Walton League has some great information on um, general water quality and um, salt in particular. That's really interesting too. And there is, um, yeah, here's the, here's the dichotomous chart here, but then here's the, um, I'm not sure what the cheat sheet is, but we'll look at the bug ID re real quick. There is a really cool app and I'll have to look at what the name of it is. Um, but there's a great app that you can put on your phone that walks you through the key and, um, you know, will tell you what the bug ID is, talks about tolerance values, talks about habitat, um, talks about its range. So, um, I can't remember if that's Virginia Saber Streams or if that's another. Um, is it the Aquabug app? Oh, yes, that's it, Megan. It's, it's Isaac Walton League. Thank you. Aquabug. Aquabug. Okay, yeah, we'll send maybe a link or, or a website out for folks to, to look at that too. But now during the test, of course, we have to put away phones, right, Megan? Yes. yes. But it's a good study resource if you're out and you want to look up something or if you're just looking at different types of macros. We use it a lot in a, some of our education events and stuff. Um, we tell a lot of the kids about it at our district. So. Awesome. Yes. Thank you. That's exactly the one I was thinking of. It's been a whole year since I've done outreach. So it feels like I know. Been here in my house with my computer. But um, anyway, I will send this is Virginia Save Our Streams um, ID cards um, walks again, walks you kind of through um, the most common bugs that you'll see. The other nice thing about this key is that it clumps the orders together. So, you know, the different um, genera of mayfly are going to, and stonefly are going to be here. So you can see kind of the variations between those. So, um, so that's really nice. They didn't have a picture of stick bait, but I encourage you to Google that on your own time or go out and it's usually around early April is when they come out. So take a peek take a peek through here. Um, while we're here, just one quick thing. I know that we have other topics to, to talk about, but dragonflies and damselflies. See how the dragonfly has three tails? Do not mistake a dragonfly for a mayfly. And that's where you really um, can use the mechanics of swimming to your advantage. And again, those feathery gills that are sometimes more, more visible on mayflies. A dragonfly is gonna swim like a shark. Uh, or I'm sorry, this is the dragonfly. The damselfly is going to swim like a shark. And so what that does is it pushes its tail back and forth on a vertical or on a horizontal axis, I mean. And again, you can't see the motion that I'm making, but 
um, you're, you're basically, he's swinging the tail back and forth to be able to move rather than um, kind of going up and down and up and down in like a wavelength kind of format. So dragonflies, or I'm sorry, damselflies and mayflies, a little tricky. While you're on this page, Brent um, sent in a question of, do you have any tricks to distinguishing the difference between members of Megaloptera? Oh, Is that question. wrong? Because I can't ever pronounce order. <laughs> <laughs> Brent's okay. giving me a thumbs up though, so we're good. <laughs> That's good. Um, you know, we're only going to ask for order. So if you can tell that um, it's a Helgramite, I mean, some of the most basic, can I zoom in? I can zoom in. Some of the most basic characteristics here are those huge pinchers, even though here the pinchers are, are closed, um, here they're, they're more open. Um, the, the fluttering gills that are actually underneath these sharp spines along the abdomen are another um, telltale sign. Um, I'm trying, I'll, I'll have to look and, and maybe even ask our biologists for any additional tips and tricks, Brent, sorry about that. He said that's good. Um, and then one more that came in. Could you put out acceptable ranges for other chemicals as well as dissolved oxygen like NO3, PO4, alkalinity, etc.? You might have that to cover later. So yeah, and I think some of this, oh golly, I'm trying to navigate around Zoom. Yeah, see some have you guys seen the aquatics curriculum guidelines? Some of this um can be found in here. Um, some of the links to um, different resources you can look through. I think the other place where um, we can look at that is on the DEQ website. Shameless plug, sorry. Um, but I will, I'll, um, just to give you an idea, here is the DEQ website, deq.virginia.gov, Virginia, the whole word spelled out. Department of Environmental Quality. Um, this is a new website, so it's still under construction, um, but you can navigate to water quality and kind of um, wander around here a little bit. There's some information on water quality standards. It's very bureaucratic. So I will, um, I will either find some summary documents or I'll put it together for you for water chemistry, um, some of those basics. Um, I think the other thing to remember is there's no water quality standards for nutrients. We have water quality standards for our field parameters, such as where streams, again, in a range should generally be for, um, uh, for most of the year. So we have temperature ranges, we have dissolved oxygen ranges, we have um, pH ranges. And the pH actually does take into account um, the geography and the geology of where it's located. So some mountain streams are actually lower. Um, as they're coming off the mountain, there's not as much as of a limestone buffer um, to, to, to kind of neutralize some of the acid rain influence and impacts that we've seen. So um, our pH in mountain streams is actually a little bit uh, lower than it is for, um, for our, our valley streams. So um, I'll put together kind of like a summary uh, water basics, but we do not have water quality standards for nutrients like uh, total nitrogen, total phosphorus, ammonia. Um, we have acute criteria, which basically means that it cannot go over this amount because we know that that will have a, an impact to aquatic life. Um, but there's no uh, uh, enshrined water quality standards because if you think about, you know, the entirety of Virginia, we have the mountains, we have the Piedmont, we have the tidal basin, um, we have swamp waters, we have free flowing waters. So it's just really hard to come up with one particular rain, even range that would accommodate all of those different habitats. Um, so right now, the Commonwealth of Virginia does not have water quality standards for nutrients. Um, and I, there was another, uh, parameter that you mentioned, Megan, can you, that was in there? Alkalinity. Alkalinity. Okay. Well, that could, yeah, we don't have a, a specific water quality standard for that, but I'll, I'll come up with some ranges and send that out for your, for your group. So, 
Um, okay, so the next thing moving, again, feel free to pop those questions in. This is really helpful to be able to kind of uh, move our discussion around what you guys really need to know and want to discuss. But um, here's something that has come up in the past. This is a Strahler stream order, okay? Um, and basically he was trying to number streams. He was trying to come up with a way to characterize and, and differentiate between headwater streams, those streams that are way high up in the, um, in the watershed versus larger order streams. Um, so, you know, just for an example, think about, um, you know, your, your stream that's coming off Shenandoah National Park, right? It's coming down into, you know, a valley stream that's really small and then that flows into the South Fork Shenandoah and then the South Fork, you know, flows in, uh, joins the North Fork and Front Royal and becomes the Shenandoah River. You follow the Shenandoah through the Panhandle of West Virginia, it becomes the Potomac. So you can kind of see the volume and the structure of those streams changes with increasing um, drainage area and, um, and the, the hydrology and the, um, the structure of the stream, you know, uh, changes as it gets bigger and bigger. So the thing to remember with Strahler stream order is that it always starts out with the little guys. So the little guys way up here in the headwaters are ones. And then when a one and a one join together, if two of the same number join together, it gets bumped up into the next number. So a one and a one make a two, right? But the thing to remember, if, a, if another little one joins a two, it does not move. It has to be two numbers of the same um, uh, order to jump to the next order. So a two and a two have to come together for a three. So I hope I hope that makes a little bit of sense. I can send, this is, I don't know, this is off of a website a while ago um, with a quick, here you go, geography website. Um, uh, because this is something that is, within the state curriculum. And I know that it's something that is generally um, in some way, shape or form on the state test. So this is something good to know. Does anybody have any questions? I'm not seeing any, but okay. maybe if I think pop in here. <laughs> that's all right. I think it's just one of those things. A lot of people will see this for the first time on an Envirothon test and not know what it is or what what, what it means. Um, so just familiarizing yourself, I don't know, you can probably find some practice stuff online, but um, it, it's it's another little thing. It's definitely not as big as your macroinvertebrates or your fish ID or things like that, but it is good to know. All right, any other questions? I have none, so I think Popping you're safe. All right, so, um, Going back to my Zoom keeps taking away my, there we go, uh, aquatic. So here's the, the curriculum guidelines here. Um, I would, I'll make sure that Megan, that, that I send this to you. It is available on the Envirothon website. If you're not familiar, there's some great resources um, that are that are available through this curriculum that kind of walks you through the different skill sets to develop. Um, one of these suggested activities that I did want to mention is being able to identify a, a watershed. So um, there is generally a delineation, a watershed delineation that's worth a small amount of points on the area um, exam. And so what you're doing here is you're looking at um, it's a, a topographic map and you're, you're connecting the highest points, right? All the places where the water, where a raindrop's gonna come down and, um, and flow into the stream is gonna be that overall watershed. So um, familiarizing yourself with some, with some topo maps. Um, I generally would encourage folks to go to like mountainous areas, like pull up um, a map of like George Washington National Forest because there's such steep inclines there that you can really see uh, and the, the mountains are very starkly contrasted. So you can kind of connect the mountaintops and get a sense of how to delineate the watershed. Um, understanding, you know, that 
all of that water is going to be draining into the into the stream and then um, you know just kind of getting a sense in a very starkly contrasted landscape it'll be easier to translate over into something that's maybe a little bit um, more rolling hills or something like that so delineating a watershed and that link didn't work as but as well as I was hoping it was going to but I was thinking that that it would take you to uh, um, to a topo map, but it did not. So anyway, that's something that's that's pretty um, pretty easy to develop and easy to to work out. All right. Any other questions? They would like to discuss fish ID. Um, if you might have that, I don't know what all you were going to cover. So maybe a little touch on fish ID um, somewhere in your presentation. So I think we sure. still have about a half an hour. So we still have some time. So. Excellent. All righty. Um, so uh, let's see. So honest to goodness, the, oh, I'm sorry. Did you say something, Megan? No, you're good. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, honest to goodness, the best place to go for fish ID is, or, or to familiarize yourself with freshwater fishes, because um, for these area, um, uh, I can't type and talk at the same time. Because um, up in the, the area one and the area two, um, land masses you're just going to have to worry about freshwater fish when you get if when you get to the state level you probably want to expand from there and understand tidal and bay fish but for the area um exam you just really um need to worry about freshwater um so understanding what fish are native to the waterways that you guys are are in um I'm going to point you to some resources right here on the uh, DWR. This used to be DGIF. So if I say DGIF, I apologize. Old habits die hard, but it is the Division of Wildlife Resources. They have some great um, books as well. Paul Bugis, who was the, um, the district, <clears throat> excuse me, manager for many years, um, put together a great book called Freshwater Fish of Virginia. Um, it's actually on my nightstand. <laughs> um, uh, if your if your coach wants to invest, you know, twenty dollars into the future of the program, that's a great um, resource to have. It is a paper book, so maybe it's a little outdated, but it's a it's great to be able to to refer to. So um, here we are on DWR. I will make sure that this link is. Um, included in the material that I send to Megan. So you can kind of go through and look at um, what's here. So just understanding some of the different fish categories, here's sunfish versus bass versus perch versus trout. Understanding the difference between body shape um, can really help um, just get you into the, into the right category. Hopefully you guys are seeing this. There we go. Yeah, so um, understanding brook trout, you should probably know brook trout. I'm just saying it's our state fish. This would be a really good one to know. Um, uh, and it's the other thing is that it is endangered and it's um, on the path to recovery through because of efforts of a, a large swath of organizations, not just DWR or government agencies, but also Trout Unlimited. Um, the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. There's a, a ton of great organizations that are coalescing around this cause. So um, it's pretty, pretty exciting. So understanding the difference in the body between, let's say, um, a trout, which is a predator, which is, you know, used to cold water, it's a cold, it's a mountain fish versus a nice warm water fish like the bluegill um, or the bream, uh, sun, you know, it's also known as a sunfish. Um, you know, you can see uh, the differences in the um, in the fins here. Oh, and that's the other thing: understanding the different parts of a fish would be good. I will forward that to you too. 
All right, we have a few questions. One are one is are brook and rainbow trout the same? Okay, the answer is no. So there's only one trout that is native to Virginia. That means naturally found in Virginia. And that is the brook trout. I'm gonna go back. Okay. We'll go into brown trout and rainbow trout in a sec, but look at the look at the brook trout. Um, understand the the rosiness underneath and these little different colored spots. Um, the the rosy undercolor is actually a breeding um, uh, enhancement, if you will. So when they're laying eggs, when they are um, in the process of that, which is generally um, late spring. They're, they're even more colored up, but um, even when they're a little bit duller, you can see the different colored spots. I wonder if I can zoom in on this. I won't let me, but um, really understanding the coloration of the different trout is going to help you. Um, so rainbow trout are found in the Pacific Northwest. Rainbow trout are very beautiful. They were introduced to um, help out the fishing industry to, you know, um, they're a little less sensitive to temperature and pH than um, brook trout. Brook trout are extremely sensitive. They only, again, they're the princesses of clean water. They are only going to live um, where it's super clean and where it's super cold. Um, so even when some of the uh, Shenandoah Valley streams um, come down out of the mountains of the National Forest or the National Park, when they start hitting the valley floor and warming up in those summer months, the rain or the um, brook trout will actually retreat up into the headwaters, even if there's less water available, they kind of congregate in these conservation pools. Um, and Paul Bugis and um, uh, some other JMU researchers have done some really interesting uh, research about how they kind of set aside their predatory behavior during those times. And they're focused in on this one big pool um, and they all kind of have a pact of truce, if you will, and they won't eat each other for a little while at least until it starts raining and they can, there's more water in the stream and they're able to migrate throughout the stream channel again. All right, so back to rainbow trout. Rainbow trout, you can see the rosy, rosiest brown color is actually on the top and it gets uh, kind of more green as it goes farther onto the, to the belly of the fish. Um, again, you can kind of see uh, it's less of an underbite here in the mouth parts than a brook trout. I wouldn't hang my hat on that as much as I would the coloration itself. And brown trout are actually native to Germany. And again, they were introduced as a game fish. Um, apparently they're a lot of fun. I haven't caught a brown trout, but apparently they're a lot of fun because they really like to fight back. Um, if anybody has any fun stories to regale us, you could do that. Um, but here, here again, brown trout, is kind of a, a really good name for it. The spots are darker. You'll notice in a brook trout, you'll see like the white outline of the spots with coloration in the middle whereas a brown trout's gonna have darkly colored spots and it's gonna be kind of that, that muddy brown uh, kind of uh, color. So yeah, just kind of looking at these, I know pictures are not the same as a live specimen. And if we were having Envirothon in person, um, I would always try to have a live fish if I could swing it. Um, that's not always possible, but being familiar with, with what a live specimen looks like versus um, the pictures or, or an artist rendition is really good to have. So, you know, kind of looking through photos. If you have a friend who has a pole and a, and a rod and you can go out and do some fishing with them, that's helpful too. But yeah, those are the three trouts. What's another question, Megan? Um, currently, what are the most endangered or threatened species and the most invasive ones? Ooh, good question. So for fish, excuse me, the most um, the most threatened is definitely going to be uh, the trout, the brook trout. That is where a good deal of our, again, speaking in terms of freshwater upriver um, habitats, right, where we live in area one and area two is going to be the brook trout, hands down. Um, in terms of some invasive species, we've got the snakehead fish. Um, we have, uh, there's been reports of snakehead 
fish found uh, just outside of Winchester. So this is definitely something that has migrated beyond uh, just the Potomac water. You know, there for a while it was it was kind of confined to Northern Virginia because they were released from restaurants um, in that area. That's not the case anymore. It's it's um, you know kind of found all over. Uh, so you can kind of watch a little bit more about the snake head fish. Apparently they are delicious. I don't know if this is true, but just, just FYI, um, snake heads are supposed to be good. So if you find one, not only should you report it immediately and make sure you kill it by grilling it and eating it. I'm just saying. Um, I don't know that much about the, um, Alabama bass that's listed on here. I can't say that I could speak to that, but um, that could be something um, that would be on the test here. Uh, so apparently this was a game fish that was introduced. Um, I think another place where you could find some additional information, going back to the aquatics curriculum, um, understanding you know, kind of on the larger scale, understanding the importance of zebra mussels, which are an invasive species that were found in ballast, um, excuse me, starting in the Great Lakes and then and then they've kind of moved in the Potomac uh, Reservoir as well. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to find, there's, there's some links on here that we can, um, there you go, aquatic nuisance species and then the task force itself. Um, I'll go here and kind of walk through real quick. So Megan, we're going all the way till 1130, correct? I think they may cut us off at 1125 because of the okay. five minute switch. Um, so we have about 15 minutes. Okay, perfect. All right, so yeah, so here's a little bit more about zebra mussels. Those are really nasty um, because they outcompete our native mussels. Asiatic clams would be another aquatic invasive species. Um, that you'll see. And actually, if you um, if you're walking along a stream bank and you see these little, you know, fourth graders, of course, call them seashells, heavy sigh. Um, but if you see these white little little clam shells um, that have a greenish tinge, most likely 90% of the time, those are going to be Asiatic clams. Um, they have just taken over and outcompeted our native clams and native mussels. Um, there still are native mussels, and there's some really cool research being done by EPA right now um, to determine where there are still surviving colonies of native mussels. And what they used to do is just strap on scuba gear and do stream surveys, which don't get me wrong, is a ton of fun, is a great day on the water but it takes a lot of time and a lot of resources, right? Because you have to have all these people and you have to ferry them out, et cetera, et cetera. What they're doing now to save on that time and resources is actually taking a sample of water and they will look for the DNA of our native mussels in the water because um, the way that mussels reproduce is by, you know, just kind of spurting out their, um, their, their eggs, if you will, um, out into the water. And because that DNA is found in the water column, they can kind of identify different streams that, um, that do have mussels present and then can implement protection measures on, on those streams. So that's pretty cool. Um, well, what's another question? I don't have any more at the moment, but if somebody, okay. wants to, oh, here comes one. What are some examples of protection measures? For the mussels, I wonder. Oh. Um, so protection measures yeah, for, for the mussels. Yes, okay, sorry. <laughs> Just a clarifying uh, question. So some protection measures would be um, implementing strict effluent standards. So any dischargers that have permits on that stretch of river would um, would be asked to take additional samples, look at what they're discharging, even though all of our water discharge permits that are um, that are given out by the DEQ are all to be designed to be within water quality standards. If we know that there are special 
um, populations of protected organisms like a native mussel, then we would implement stricter standards. And so we'd work with the um, dischargers, whether it's a wastewater treatment plant or um, uh, the, the Merck factory in Elkton, Virginia that discharges to the South Fork of the Shenandoah. You know, we work with those um, dischargers to, to try and figure out how to, you know, tweak their discharge and make it just a little bit cleaner. Um, we generally do this on a cooperative basis, um, less, less heavy handed and more reaching out a hand to help um, kind of situation, but um, it's definitely something that, that we've come across, especially in smaller streams rather than some of the larger streams. But um, also looking at whether we can work with the soil and water conservation districts like Megan and Stephanie and the other great people who are here on this Saturday morning, um, asking them to kind of work with some landowners. If there's any landowners um, who may still have cattle access to those waters. Um, if there's any uh, homeowners in the area that still have what we call um, uh, direct discharge, which is basically, you know, they, they don't have a septic system or maybe their septic system is failing and they need a little bit of assistance to, um, to repair or replace that system with something that's going to decrease um, their impact on our local waterways. So it's definitely more of a cooperative effort. I don't want anybody to to go home thinking that the heavy hand of government is is forcing its will on the people or anything, but um, it's something that you know, as a commonwealth, um, Virginia takes its its commitment to protecting our natural resources pretty seriously. So that's that's an evolving situation. Let's put it that way. One other thing I remembered I wanted to go over is uh, hydrogeology. So we're talking about groundwater here. Um, this is, I'll send this out. This is um, an article about the ABCs of hydrogeology. I'm not saying you have to read the article, but what is very um, helpful is some of the illustrations here that talk about and really um, describe very clearly the different um, layers of groundwater. Here's the water table where water is free flowing, water is kind of moving through the soil. It's free and available. Here's an un unconfined aquifer. Um, so this is this is a point where there's water free flowing and um, you know wells can be tapped in. But the difference between an unconfined aquifer and a confined aquifer, you can kind of see here because um, the the artesian aquifer that's under pressure due to the confinement is where you're going to see your flowing art artisan wells, artesian, excuse me, art, artesian wells here um, that come up and, um, you know, having those two confining layers keeps the aquifer in between under pressure and, and um, it doesn't allow for the aquifer to be influenced by any sort of pollution or contamination that might happen on the surface of the land. Um, but it also means that it won't be recharged, right, uh, as, as easily. Now here, they, they give you a little kind of um, demonstration of what a recharge area for an artesian aquifer would look like. I can tell you in, in nature, they're um, not all that easy to find, but because they are, you know, within these two impervious layers, um, it makes them very clean generally, but it also makes it so that once you, that, that it's really hard to um, recharge and it's, it's hard to uh, add any additional water to that. So um, this is an issue out um, east of 95 in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, there's so many people that have tapped into um, the aquifer, the main confined aquifer out there that um, they're really worried about it running dry in the next you know, 50 to 100 years. So um, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the aquifer right now, but um, that's not something that's going to be on the area test, but it very well may be on the state test. So um, for those of you who are, are going on, be sure to look at groundwater issues on a statewide level, not just the, the local area level. 
Any questions coming in, Megan? Um, I don't have any more. So if you have anything else to cover, go for it. I think my little box up here in the top says maybe 11 minutes remaining. Um, so they might have us going until 1130. But... Okay. Well, how about in the meantime, I show you guys this super cool mapping on DEQ website. So if you go and, and uh, Megan, please feel free to interrupt me. If people do have questions and pop it in the chat box, I'm happy to, to take those. I'm just gonna, in the meantime, while we have some time, I'm gonna show you some additional resources. So here we are, dq.virginia.gov. If you scroll down, go to data and GIS. Um, our agency has invested in geographic information systems. Um, over the last year, we, we hired a, an administrator who is his only job is to better update our data sets and our mapping services, not just for DEQ employees, but for you know everyone who's interested, the public at large. So when you're here, we're we're calling it the Environmental Data Hub. Doesn't that sound professional and exciting? And so um, what I, the, the open data portal is more for professional services. You know, if you someday you're working for an environmental consulting firm and you need some data sets, this would be a place where you you could go. Um, but for now, I wanted to point you towards the interactive web mapping tool. So just click right on over here. Um, and here we go. So the environmental data mapper is the application itself that houses um, the data layers that are available to the public. I can tell you that there's a lot on here to kind of move through and investigate if you're ever um, you know, awake at 2 a.m. and you are super curious about how many pollution response complaints have been made um, over the last you know, 24 hours, you can go on here and you can find out. So it's, it's um, a great example of transparency. Um, and it's also going to help you navigate through to some of the water resources questions that we have um, on the Envirothon test. And while this is loading, hopefully it won't take as long for you. But um, there's the Commonwealth of Virginia. The little green buildings are our regional offices. You're going to agree to this. I promise it's not going to spam you. Um, so here's our regional office in Harrisonburg. I'm with the Valley Regional Office. I'm, I'm, um, I forgot to introduce myself. So I'm the water monitoring and assessment manager for the Valley Regional Office. I oversee a team of um, biologists, water quality monitors, as well as, um, as uh, planners who look at the streams and rivers that do not meet water quality standards and then go ahead and develop TMDLs or total maximum daily load studies um, for them. This is an action that's mandated by the Clean Water Act. You should probably also know that for the test. Um, and then um, the other member of our team actually takes the TMDL studies to understand um, what is going on with our rivers, what's causing the pollution. And what she does is she actually goes to the next step and talks about how to clean up those waters. What's the best way um, to get these waterways back to a safe and healthy condition. So um, we're a team of, of seven people doing um, five different kinds of jobs and we all work together really well. So, um, I'm zooming in here on the northern middle valley just to kind of give you an idea of what's here. I'm turning off some of these layers. You're welcome to kind of go through. I'm focusing in on our water monitoring layers. So here's all of the stations. And actually, I guess I could zoom out a little bit. There we go. We'll, we'll do more statewide. Here we go. So here's all of the monitoring stations that DEQ is monitoring for this calendar year. And you can see they're all coded. Um, and here's the key down here. There we go. So we have our, our ambient monitoring. Um, we have our benthic monitoring. Benthic is collecting those benthic macroinvertebrates to understand the stream um, condition. We have uh, sites out in the Chesapeake Bay. 
We have TMDL trying to understand um, how streams that have already been through the TMDL process, excuse me, how they're doing um, afterwards, what's their, what's their condition, you know, five, 10 years after uh, we've done the study. Um, there's some incident response here. So if there's been a pollution um, incident, let's say a, a truck overturned on 81 and spilled the load of gasoline it was carrying into Christians Creek. Um, we could, you know, set up a, uh, a station there to understand um, how the stream is doing over time, whether it's recovering. Um, there's some base stations. Uh, so feel free to, to kind of check out those. The other thing I wanted to show you, I'm going to turn this off. I'm going to turn on our water quality assessment layers. So here we've got to zoom in a little bit more. This is where you can see whether a stream is impaired or if um, it is fully supporting. So a stream that is impaired is not meeting its water quality standards. I've got to zoom in even more. And so these streams we call impaired because um, they're not meeting um, water quality standards. They're not to the safe and healthy condition that, that we as the Commonwealth would expect them to be. I'm not sure why this is grayed out still, but we'll try. Hmm, if I zoom in a little bit more. There we go. Okay, so lesson learned. In order to see the impairment layers, you can see uh, these streams in red that don't meet water quality standards versus the fully supporting, which is the green ones. You have to be zoomed in pretty close to where you're looking. So this is Shenandoah County, um, Woodstock, Edinburgh, here's 81 as it goes north through south through the valley. Uh, north is Winchester, south is Harrisonburg. So that kind of gives you an idea. What you can do is you can actually, when you're highlighted on it, you can click and it'll give you some additional information. So, um, so it, the first thing I pulled up was the county boundary, but then the next, you can see that it highlights in that turquoise color and it'll tell you um, some bureaucratic information, the assessment unit ID and that sort of stuff. That's just used for reporting to EPA, but it will tell you, um, you know, what monitoring station was used for assessment and why it's impaired. So um, for this one, you can see um, E. coli is bacteria, right? That is the um, type of bacteria that we use to determine risk to human health. And, um, uh, it tells you that 13 of the 18 samples exceeded the E. coli water quality standard. So we're kind of sad about that. That's not a good thing. That's why that waterway um, is impaired as of 2020. Um, so every two years, we look at the new data set um, to understand whether these streams are, are uh, changing in condition, whether they're still impaired, whether they're not. Um, whether they've come back. We always like those, those ones that, that what we call are delisted or they're taken off the dirty waters, the impaired waters list and brought back to a fully supporting condition. So take a peek around there. Um, and let's see what else. And then here's just the, the hydrology layer in general, that's kind of probably gonna go over top of your impaired waters list. But um, these water quality assessment layers um, are, are interesting as well. I think there's a topo um, option up here. If you look at the list, oh, that just makes it go away. Um, but anyway, in terms of going back to our delineation exercises, I think this could be, you know, you can turn on the topo map here and kind of go up into, let's say, if we're scrolling, if we go out just a little bit, go up into um, places where, uh, there's there's some significant slope. So I'm thinking out here in George Washington National Forest in the National Park along the parkway. And you can really um, see very clearly the topographic lines and be able to um, link those uh, highest elevations together to kind of form a ring around where 
And I'm trying to zoom in so that you can kind of, oh, no. Megan, did we have any other questions while I'm zooming in here? We do not, but we only have like a minute left. So if you want to- yeah, That's okay. I just want to be sure to check. I will say while you're zooming that we appreciate your help today, your um, input, your answering your questions and all the resources that you shared. So I just wanted to say thank you um, for doing that. Um, I know it's a Saturday and we appreciate you giving up a, a little bit of your time. No worries at all. And yeah, I'll put together, um, especially some of the, the questions that, um, that we had and, and I'll put together like a list of resources um, for folks to, to check out. Uh, hopefully people have the Envirothon website kind of down pat, but there's some additional places where you can go for more information. Yes. And if you want to send that stuff to me, Tara, I will be sure to get it to Stephanie and she can get it out to everyone. Um, I think she has the master list of emails. So that would be awesome. Thank you, Megan. Thanks everybody for being here. I'm looking forward to it. I'm a, I'm a product of Envirothon. So I, I appreciate the chance to, um, to give back. So I think we're all going to end up back in the main room here in a few seconds. Um, so Alrighty, thanks everybody. And Ashley, what do you think about bringing, leave it, asking our moderators and judges to stay in the main room again and see how it worked? Does that sound pretty good? Yep. All right, everybody is coming on back. So thank you for participating in our aquatics session, whether you were in beginner aquatics or advanced aquatics. I'm sure.